pray. O Almighty God, who has built thy church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the head cornerstone, grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their doctrine, that we may be made an holy temple acceptable unto thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, here we are at the last lecture. Um, my uh, gratitude um, for you all for coming and listening to me rambling through this material, to Professor Van Hooser for asking me, to Ben for being such an organiser, and to the institution for putting up with me. Uh, is very real. I'm grateful to have been here. Um, these will appear in print at some point, so I'm told. Uh, although quite when, I'm going to get an opportunity to um, expand them. I'm not quite sure. Maybe at four o'clock another morning. So we're going to end with some material on ecclesiology. At the hands of some recent theologians, ecclesiology has acquired the status of first theology. That is, no longer a derivative or corollary topic, it's expanded to become a substrate for all Christian doctrine, a kind of condition for and component in all material Christian teaching. So rather than putting in a relatively late appearance near the conclusion of the dogmatic corpus, it's come, for some at least, to be a pervasive theme to which all other loci are to be related. If we were to ask how this expansion of ecclesiology has come about, then at least a couple of factors, I think, would need to be borne in mind. The first is the remarkable prestige enjoyed by communion ecclesiology in some dominant strands of theological and ecumenical work. The language of koinonia is widely judged to have a special potency in demonstrating the integrity of teaching about God, salvation and church, and thereby moving beyond the externalism thought to be so ecumenically ruinous. Jean-Marie Tillard, for instance, offers um, a summary statement, a compact account really of a communion ecclesiology. Communion with God himself, Trinitarian communion, and the benefits of salvation acquired by Christ, whose incarnation is a realistic communion between God and humanity, and given by his Spirit, the fraternal communion of the baptised, all of it made possible by communion in the once and for all irreversible event which, uh, of Jesus Christ, which communion in the, apostle, in the apostolic witness guarantees throughout the centuries, and which the Eucharist celebrates in its sacrament of communion. This, he says, is the church in its substance. Well, there are at least three interlocking themes of communion ecclesiology to be identified there. First of all, obviously, a good deal is made of the life of the Holy Trinity as a communion of divine persons in relation. Second, God's saving work is directed to the restoration of the communion of creator and creatures, a communion breached by sin, but restored by the Son's assumption of humanity and its outworking in the saving history of the Incarnate One. And third, the incarnational union of God and creatures is savingly extended in the Church, which is therefore integral to the mystery of salvation and not simply its annex, for it is in and as the Church and its visible practices that the saving purpose of God for communion is realised. The church, in fact, is salvation in social form. Thinking of the church and its relation to God through the idiom of koinonia is, in effect, an ecclesiological critique, and a rather strong one, of the strict demarcation between uncreated and created to which these lectures have often returned. Buttressing these dogmatic considerations is a second factor behind the expansion of ecclesiology, namely a set of metaphysical convictions about the relation of nature and supernature. These convictions are nowadays, of course, commonly encountered through the work of Henri de Lubac, most of all in his untranslated work Sur Naturel, but also in more ecclesiological tracts, Catholicism, Corpus Mysticum, or the Splendour of the Church. His forceful, if at times I think somewhat impressionistic, genealogy of the philosophical and theological roots of modern ecclesiological disorder exercises some sway. 
De Lubac, you probably know, lamented what he called the separated philosophy, which began to arise in the late 12th century, in which nature and supernature began to drift apart in such a way that nature came to have an imminent finality disintegrated from supernatural ends and so became something graspable without any reference to its ordering to participation in God. The resultant dualisms between temporal and eternal, between material form and inner substance, are for de Lubac ontologically calamitous. They segregate creatures from the creator. But they also infect ecclesiology and sacramental theology. Uh, this, of course, is the, the, the thesis of that um, slightly strange book, Corpus Mysticum. Above all, they infect sacramental theology and ecclesiology by turning the relation of Christ and the church into something wholly extrinsic. As a result, the church becomes a natural and juridically defined polity, described through a naturalised ecclesiology which can actually make little sense of the rich theology of partaking in Christ, which for de Lubac pervades the patristic and earlier medieval tradition. Well, this kind of dualism, Protestant ecclesiology, with its characteristic nervousness about the church as Christ's body, and its fondness for sharp distinctions between divine and churchly agency, is only the most fully realised example. De Lubac's explorations of the matters have of late been radicalised and rather drastically reduced by John Milbank. Now, I say reduced because, for, uh, in Milbank's account, they've become detached to some degree from the historical complexity and the generous dogmatic and spiritual instincts which de Lubac brought to bear upon the material. Milbank's programmatic essay from some years ago on the name of Jesus argues for what he calls the priority of ecclesiology. That is, in his words, Christological and atonement doctrines are secondary to definitions of the character of the new universal community or church. For Milbank, Christ and his work can't be dealt with as some kind of extrinsic datum, or they're to be understood in terms of their function within the process of the emergence of a counterpolity. Thus, he says, the Gospels can be read not as the story of Jesus, but as the story of the refoundation of a new city, a new kind of human community, Israel become the church. Jesus figures in this story simply as the founder, the beginning, the first of many. Jesus, of course the absence of language about his deity is not without significance, Jesus is to be thought of as what Milbank calls primarily a new Moses, not so much a substantial subject who's the church's source as one who, he says, comes to be simultaneously with the church. Hence, the primary affirmation, there can be an ecclesiological deduction of the incarnation and likewise of the atonement. The only thing which will really remove us from extrinsicism, he goes on to say, is the primacy of ecclesiology, the most concrete element in the Gospels, is the injunctions and examples regarding Christian practice. Only here do we identify God incarnate. Well, there is certainly a lack of restraint there, uh, even a kind of recklessness or defiance in reconfiguring with a single stroke the entire corpus of Christian dogma to make the theology of the church into its centre. The nucleus of the difficulty, I think, is the process of ecclesiological deduction. That is, arranging Christian teaching in such a way that what's said about the Saviour and about salvation is presented as an implicate of what's already been said about the new polity, which is the Christian society. Such deduction, I think, simply reverses the evangelical logic of ecclesiology. That logic can be discerned, for example, in the opening of the first of the Johannine epistles. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we saw it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life 
which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Well, what kind of orientation for ecclesiology might we find there? Well, first, most obviously, the beginning is not the church, but God. More closely, the beginning is for First John, the eternal life and fellowship of Father and Son, who together share in eternal life. If there is deduction, therefore, it's from theology proper to ecclesiology, not the reversed, because it's the divine arche, which is prevenient. Second, this eternal life, which was from the beginning, that is, utterly uncaused, doesn't rest within itself. It was made manifest in the Son, in his audible, visible, tangible presence, in his substantial and distinct identity, the unoriginate life of God is in some manner present. And he is this and does this in himself. That is, he's not simply a founder or the first of a series. He's not the initiator who's ranked with and perhaps passes over into that to which he gives rise. No, he is the divine self-manifestation from which all else unfolds, but which is, un which, but which is completed by none, because it requires no completion. Third, the history which succeeds upon this manifestation is not a repetition or continuation of the manifestation. It's not, therefore, a history which in some way fleshes out or animates an indistinct or inchoate origin. Now, what follows from the manifestation for 1 John is of a different order, namely what's called here testimony and proclamation. Testimony and proclamation are ostensive or transitive acts. That is to say, they're acts which indicate what they are not, gesturing away from themselves to that which is other than themselves, to what has been seen and heard and touched as the word of life extends itself towards creatures. And fourth, therefore, there is fellowship. Fellowship with Father and Son, and fellowship with other creatures who also exist from this witness and proclamation. There really is koinonia. Of course, the admonition of the uh, epistle as a whole is directed to a community with what sounds like an intensely segregated common life. But this fellowship can only be conceived as what it is by keeping in mind the flow of the economy as it stems from God's eternal life. The beginning, the manifestation, the witness the fellowship. Ecclesiology, you'll suggest, has its place in this sequence, and so it cannot be first theology. Well, at four o'clock this morning, that sounded really good. Um, <laughs> but let me now try to explain what I'm talking about. Okay. Let me try and expand these themes. There is, for the Christian gospel, I think, a, a we with God which answers to God with us. Because this wholly unexpected act of divine condescension has taken place, that is, because the Son has fulfilled the Father's will and redeemed Adam's race, and because together Father and Son have poured out the Holy Spirit, then Adam's sin and our continuation in it have not overwhelmed God's purpose. Indeed, the impotence of sin has been exposed by God's undeviating determination to be our God and thereby to evoke a people for himself despite themselves. The time of estrangement from God has been interrupted by the missions of word and spirit. An end has been set to it. And the created sign of this end is the existence in time of a form of common human life which is the fulfilment of God's purpose before all time form of common human life which Ephesians calls a citizenry of saints, a household of God, a holy temple, a dwelling place of God in the spirit. But what kind of account might Christian dogmatics give of this extraordinary reality? Well, a doctrine of the church is only as good as the doctrine of God upon which it is built. Because of this, Dogmatics, I think, 
will only have slender investment in depicting the life and activities of the fellowship through, for example, social phenomenology or the symbolics of religious association. The being of the community of the saints and the acts by which that community realises itself in time are sui generis. They're explicable only, it seems to me, in a very preliminary way as instances of human sociality and its practices. We only properly begin to approximate to their being when we refer to God's act of turning human polity back to himself. So terms like God's household, the temple, the dwelling place of God, are not, as it were, merely surface or secondary designations, designations which can be resolved back into more basic accounts of the church as a social historical phenomenon. No, they go all the way down. The church is, and is not merely fancifully described as, such a reality. Christian dogmatics, therefore, has, I think, to exercise some vigilance against the kind of nominalism which reduces the ecclesial to the social. Reduction which is close to hand when, for example, the Christian communities of the apostolic era are made into objects of social anthropological inquiry. Church cannot be comprehensively grasped as a magnitude in the social history of religion. But vigilance in another direction is also, I think, required. It's relatively easy to fall into the metaphysical trap which de Lubac and others have sought to unearth. Can you unearth a trap? I don't think you can unearth a trap, can you? Well, anyway, um, identify. Namely, the kind of supernaturalism in which the church's pure form must remain untainted by time. So dogmatics also has to avoid rendering the church as something less than an historical creaturely reality. Its aim, rather, is to try to sort out what kind of history the church is, what kind of creaturely acts are performed in the common life of the saints. More closely again, invoking language about God, talking about the church as God's citizenry and temple and all the rest, invoking language about God isn't a second layer of description superimposed upon a set of social phenomena which could equally well be described, perhaps even better described, as a social history. No, it's simply saying what this social history is. It is, of course, a social history. It's the passage of a people through time and all the attendant forms of collective organisation. But it is that because and only because of the realities which the Gospel announces. The realities, that is, of election, incarnation, exaltation, the bestowing of the Spirit. The Church is indeed visible, natural, social history, but to explicate it, more is needed than simply recourse to the principle of analogy from all other forms of common human life. The ontology of the Church can only be grasped if its social historical reality is seen as manifesting a particular depth. And it's this depth which Ephesians indicates by speaking of the fact that the saints and members of God's household are built upon the foundation of the prophets and apostles Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows. Reference to the church's prophetic and apostolic foundation and to Christ as its integrating and animating element is of the essence. This is what takes place in the created history of the church, an excess which eludes reduction. Well, if that's the case, then ecclesiology has its place in the basic movement of Christian doctrine from teaching about God to teaching about everything else in God. It's a derivative doctrine concerned with the economy of God's creatures and in its explication, the doctrine of God is to have operative, not merely background status. But of course, if the principle of derivation is to be observed here, so too is the principle of inclusion. The life of the people of God is a necessary theme in Christian dogmatics because dogmatics concerns not only theology but also economy. Or a bit more accurately, dogmatics is concerned with economy precisely because it's concerned with theology. Because in theology proper, 
Dolmatics attends to this one, the one whose perfect life includes the movement of bestowing and maintaining the life of creatures, then there is a necessary ecclesial component to Christian teaching, without which the doctrine of God would be imperfectly apprehended. Well, deduction of teaching about the nature of the church from teaching about the Trinity is, of course, a familiar move in contemporary theology, especially on the part of advocates of the kind of social Trinitarianism in which the relations of the persons of the Godhead are echoed in the Christian communion. There are evident benefits here, aren't there? In terms of the doctrine of God, it means getting beyond ideas of God as an undifferentiated principle or cause of the church. In terms of the doctrine of the church, it means resistance to ecclesiological naturalism. But difficulties remain, I think. Most of all, that of deploying a notion of relationality, as, uh, I don't know why people say relationality rather than just relation, but they do, don't they? A notion of relationality as a bridge term between God and creatures. Put too simply, appeal to this notion can mean that the passage from the doctrine of God to the doctrine of the church is effected too swiftly, without securing an adequate sense of the unqualified gratuity of the church's existence and of its difference from God, who is the creative power of its life. Theology and ecclesiology come to correspond rather too neatly. The shock which ought to be registered by the existence of a people of God is to some degree muffled. The relation of theology proper and ecclesiology is best expounded, therefore, not as it were by setting out two terms of an analogy, but by describing a sequence of divine acts. That sequence has its rise in the inner divine counsel or decree. That then finds temporal execution in the missions of Son and Spirit, through which the purpose of the Father bears created fruit. And that kind of agential idiom, using the language of agency, retains both the perfection and the absolute creativity of God in relation to the church, enabling theology to retain something basic to its account of the communion of the saints, namely, that the communion of the saints is creaturely, that it has been brought into existence in the course of the administration of God's gracious purpose, and so therefore the fact of its proper distinction, of the proper distinction between God as creator and the church as creature, even in their fellowship, is kept in mind. This is a little tag from Calvin on the church. He says, all those who, by the kindness of God the Father, through the work of the Holy Spirit, have entered into fellowship with Christ, are set apart as God's property and personal possession. In both its origin and its life now, therefore, the church looks to divine election. The church is possessed and therefore alive in God. Well, once again, how can we set that out in a little bit more detail? Well, first of all, if there is this we with God, which corresponds to God with us, it is so because of what Calvin here calls the kindness of God the Father. 1 John 3, see what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The existence of the church in time as a form of human fellowship is by virtue of a declarative act of divine naming. The agent of this naming is God the Father. His naming is an act of creative love through which the church comes to be. Dogmatic reflection on this naming begins from the inner Trinitarian reality of God the Father. That is, God the Father is father of the Son, and father as the one from whom, with the Son, the Spirit proceeds. That is to say, father primarily denotes God as the principle of the life of the Holy Trinity, the infinite, uncaused depth of God's triune life. And it's here, with father as uncreated origin, that ecclesiology has to begin, rather than with, for example, the inner divine relations as in some way imaged in the life of a human community. Moreover, the Father's act of loving creatures 
and naming them his children is rooted not only in the eternal relation of father and son, but also in the son's mission, which he enacts at the bidding of the father. The son consents that alongside his wholly unique relation to the father, there should also be other children, that he will be the firstborn, that he will graciously place himself at the head of Adam's lost race and re-establish its fellowship with the father. And all this is done in fulfilment of the father's love for what is not God, his resolve that creatures should be and that their lives should not be quenched even by their self-destructive abandonment of himself as the life giver. Now, just at that point, stand back for a moment. And we can see that in reflecting on this biblical statement from 1 John 3, Domatics is trying to build up an account of the identity of the divine agent and the modes of that agent's action. It's asking, who is the father and how does the father execute his work? The answers offered by Domatics are built up out of the canonical materials uh, with a close eye upon the exegetical traditions which have grown up around those principles. In other words, we're working with two principles. First, that scripture constitutes a unified witness to the gospel in such a way that its constituent texts are mutually illuminating. And second, that the spirit superintends the church's reading of scripture. In this case, therefore, dogmatics makes a construal of father and of the father's act of giving, which can then serve to characterise the human fellowship which that act brings into being. In formal terms, therefore, ecclesiology follows theology, or in material terms, because there is this father, there are these children of God, there is the church. And you'll notice here that for the apostle, the existence of the church is a matter for some astonishment. Behold the love of the Father, and so we are. The church's existence is not a fact of nature, but of grace. Its dynamic being that of adoption and the bestowing of status. Calvin comments this on that verse from 1 John 3, 1. It was not common honour that the Heavenly Father bestowed on us when he adopted us as his children. For when the Apostle says that love has been bestowed, he means that it is from mere bounty and benevolence that God makes us his children. For why are we sons? Even because God began to love us freely when we deserved hatred rather than love. Now Calvin there is touching, I think, on something fundamental to the church's being, namely that it exists in grace, in particular in the act of the Father whereby he names us as children of God, and so we are. Name means that identity, status, nature, and therefore task, are received by creatures when God speaks as their author. This, of course, is why, or further reason why, there cannot be that ecclesial deduction of Christology or soteriology or of any other locus of Christian teaching. The inner content of ecclesiology is such that it can only be deduced. It can no more act as a foundation for teaching about God than the creature can be that from which the creator is deduced. Teaching about the church is retrospective. It draws its substance from that which was from the beginning. And that beginning includes the love of the eternal father who adopts creatures into fellowship through the person and saving acts of the eternal son. So we move therefore to the second element in this Trinitarian deduction of the church, which is the person and work of the son of God. Well, in relating ecclesiology to Christology, a lot's going to hang on ensuring that the full compass of Christology is kept in mind and that all the relevant material is allowed to be operative. When this doesn't happen, because too narrow a selection of Christological material is deemed pertinent, ecclesiology can suffer disfigurement. So, on the one hand, the person and work of the Son can be so wholly identified with his incarnate presence that his eternal pre-existent deity recedes from view. Or, on the other hand, the post-existence of the Son in his state of exaltation can recede from view, 
exercising little or no regulative role in ecclesiology. In both cases, Christology is constricted by allowing its central episode, the temporal career of the Son, as it were, to expand and fill the whole. An immediate result of this is that the metaphysics of the Church tends to be expounded with a view to one question, namely, what kind of continuity is there between the incarnate body and the ecclesial body? And this, in turn, I think, is connected to the way in which a constricted ecclesiology both is produced by and reinforces selectivity in treating the canonical witness. The most obvious case in point of this, I think, is concentration on the image of the church as the body of Christ, requiring that image to bear a good deal more weight in dogmatic ecclesiology than it in fact does in scripture, and allowing it to shape all the major lines of argument in a doctrine of the church. Not only, I think, does this load the metaphor with expectations which it can't fulfil, but it also leads to some ecclesiological malformation, as the reality of the church is in some measure detached from the Son's perfection. Well, what would happen if dogmatic ecclesiology took a rather different tack and began somewhere else? Well, at least two possibilities suggest themselves, or did so at about, I think, quarter to five this morning. The doctrine of election, or the doctrine of Christ's exaltation. Of course, a full ecclesiology would treat both tracts of material. Both ensure the right sort of externality of Christ's relation to the church. Both enable dogmatics to keep in mind the miraculous or gratuitous nature of the church's existence in time. Both give proper weight to the fact that the church is creature. And precisely so, both are able to indicate the full force of we with God. That is, they're able to generate a theology of God's communion with creatures without falling into what Calvin called that crassa mixtura, that gross mixture of God and creatures, which Calvin abhors in Oseander, and variants of which continue to rattle around in some strands of contemporary ecclesiology. Well, in continuation of the argument of my previous lecture, um, let me just say a few things on the exaltation of Christ and its ecclesiological significance and leave election for the finished version. It is, I think, for the New Testament, ecclesiologically elemental that the Son of God is in heaven. He who descended is he who ascended far above all the heavens. We have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, and so on. Well, the ecclesiological importance of this is that the Son's relation to the church is in a deep sense external. Now, to make that claim isn't to contradict the union with Christ which is proper to the church as one of the fruits of redemption. The church is indeed made alive together with Christ. It is raised up with him. It sits with him in the heavenly places. This being with the church, sorry, this being with Christ has ontological weight. That is, the church has its being with him. But what's the force of this with? Well, for my money, it indicates an intimacy of relation between Christ and those whom he exalts to share his location, but nevertheless, a relation in which he retains his free, sovereign, incommunicable identity. His co-location with the church is not such that his identity as the exalted son becomes porous or that he's no longer gracious towards the community. The church adds nothing to the identity of the exalted son. By grace, uh, twice there in Ephesians 2, by grace is not merely a way of talking of the means of the church's entry into union with Christ, it's the permanent characteristic of that union, and therefore a signifier that the church's relation to its Lord is characterised by ever greater dissimilarity. And it's this element of distinction between the church and its Lord, which I think is routinely muted in ecclesiologies ordered around the body metaphor, 
Robert Jensen's account of the matter is a striking, uh, because rather drastic, example. Embodiment on his account, this is his account of it in the systematic theology, although he um, has it elsewhere as well. Embodiment on Jensen's account is what he calls a person's availability to other persons and thereupon to her or himself. You notice that the account begins from observations about embodiment rather than from the identity of the agent of whom the metaphor is predicated, but nevertheless, let's not worry about that at the moment. Embodiment is a person's availability to other persons and thereupon to her or himself. The ecclesiological extension of this principle of embodied availability runs like this. That the church is the body of Christ means that she is the object in the world as which the risen Christ is an object for the world, an available something as which Christ is there to be addressed and grasped. Where am I to aim my intention, to intend the risen Christ? Well, the first answer, Jensen says, must be to the assembled church, and, if I'm in the assembly, to the gathering that surrounds me. And so, the church, with her sacraments, is truly Christ's availability to us, just because Christ takes her as his availability to himself. Where does the risen Christ turn to find himself, Jensen asks? To the sacramental gathering of believers. Well, that's a bit odd, isn't it? It's surely odd to ask where the risen one turns to find himself. One could hardly ask that question of God unless the attribute of perfection had ceased to bear any real weight. And to ask it of the risen Christ assumes that his identity is in the process of construction rather than eternally replete. This leads Jensen to develop, I think, a rather strained account of the otherness of Christ to the Church, focused on the Eucharistic elements. The object that is the Church assembly is the body of Christ, that is, Christ available to the world and to her members, just in that the Church gathers around objects distinct from herself, the bread and the cup, which are the availability to her of the same Christ. Within the gathering, we can intend Christ as the community we are, without self-deification, because we jointly intend the identical Christ in the sacramental elements in our midst, which are other than us. But this sounds to me like an emergency measure, which can scarcely compensate for the absence of a sense of Christ's singular, self-constituting subjectivity as the enthroned son. Wouldn't it be better, therefore, to say something like this, that the Church is the body of Christ because its being is a predicate of his lordly and complete identity and activity. He is the head of the body, the Church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And the string of metaphors there in Colossians 1, headship, origination, primogeniture, preeminence, they're all, of course, terms of relation. The exalted one isn't separate from the church. Fellowship flows from his work, for he is the reconciler. But the fellowship which he brings about is not such that the identity of the exalted one is extended, completed, enacted, intended in the community over which he presides. The eternal son creates the church by exalting it to, it, to his side, but he does not thereby create or intend himself, for his identity is antecedently replete. As himself, Theos, his identity as son is given him by the Father in full measure. As this one, he is far above all the heavens. Well, that train of thought simply repeats basic dogmatic rules, that we with God derive from God with us, and that God with us doesn't mean the diffusion of God's life, but its self-originating generativity. Because this is so, there really is fellowship with God. There really are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. The risen one doesn't cast about him to find his identity or intend himself. He declares himself in that lovely phrase from Hebrews 2, here am I and the children God has given me. The third element in the Trinitarian deduction of the church is, of course, pneumatology. The Church is and acts by virtue of the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. 
There's an order, isn't there, to that confession about the Spirit. The Spirit gives life because he is Lord. Whatever is said about the economic activity of the Spirit is therefore predicated upon his consubstantiality with Father and Son. His quickening is the work of the eternal majesty, says Ambrose. Its effectiveness rests upon the fact that the Spirit is no imminent created power, that he is not amongst but above all things. Ambrose's point is that the Spirit isn't to be numbered amongst creatures. But it's precisely as this one, that is one who shares in the eternal lordship of God, that the Spirit is active in the created realm as life giver. It's common in Christian theology to speak of the Holy Spirit as the divine agent of creaturely perfection. That is, the one in whom the works of God towards creatures are completed so that creatures attain their end. Creatures don't have life in themselves and so cannot maintain their own life, but they are maintained by the Spirit through whose presence and activity creatures do indeed live, act in spontaneity, move through time, deliberate and relate and all the rest. Above all, the Spirit gives new life since he is the divine agent who consummates Christ's objective work of reconciliation, realising in a final way God's purpose for creaturely being in fellowship with himself. In fulfilment of the Father's decree, in consequence of the Son's perfect work of reconciliation, the Spirit creates a human reality in which the old order of sin and death has been set aside and the life of the children of God is unleashed. Through the Spirit, it comes about that there exists a temporal, social, bodily reality in fulfilment of the divine appointment, you shall be my people. All this takes place as the accomplishment of the Spirit's mission, that is, the Spirit's being sent by Father and Son, in order to effect in time the full realisation of the economy of redemption. There is a stream of life which flows from heaven towards creatures, whose source is God the Father and whose power is God the Son, and this is the Holy Spirit by whom heaven and earth, eternity and time are joined. The Spirit, writes Calvin, truly unites things separated in space. Now to press this point further, by virtue of the Spirit's sending, presence and activity, there is a human society which, again in Calvin's phrase, keeps us in the society of God. By the Spirit, a form of human fellowship or common human life is brought into being of which it can be said that those who participate in it thereby in some way participate in fellowship with the Holy Trinity. To be in this society is therefore to be on the way to the fulfilment of created nature in heaven. Behold, the dwelling of God is with men, he will dwell with them, they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. Now again, in speaking of the, in those kinds of terms, we're speaking about a visible human society which takes form in certain human activities. The church is a visible human fellowship. It's an association with communicative, symbolic, institutional shape. However, these visible forms are not, as it were, self-enclosed bits of nature, patented description without invocation of language about God. They're creaturely forms, animated by the coming of the Spirit to serve as an order of signs that is, as created accessories used by God to give profile, social extension and endurance to life in fellowship with himself. God's presence and action is neither wholly within these forms nor wholly without them. Instead, the Spirit quickens these forms so that by his use of them, the human society of the church is kept in God's presence. And so we can speak of the visible forms of the church as the sphere of the secret power, the arcana virtus of the Holy Spirit, as Calvin called it. This power is a divine movement. God is not immobile, nor does he so inhabit the church as to find his identity therein. No, as spirit, God is in movement towards creatures, turning towards them out of the unlimited abundance of his own life, giving life to the church's acts, dwelling with them, but as the Lord who has his own place. Two signs of the society of the church are especial fields of the Spirit's activity in the upbuilding of the fellowship, scripture and sacrament. There is a third, of course, which is um, office in the church, but 
that would mean I've missed my plane, so <laughs> not talk about it. Life in the society of the church takes place under the sign of Holy Scripture, set up by the Spirit as that by which God keeps the church in the truth of the gospel. Holy Scripture is the canon of prophetic and apostolic writings whose authorship and reception are the Spirit's work. Their human authors are moved by the Holy Spirit, which is to say that what's encountered in these texts isn't a purely human impulse, but speech which is from God. And those who read and hear these words are able to read and hear them as divine communication, as revelation, because, they're them, because they themselves are caught up in a further movement of the Spirit in which he bestows upon such readers and hearers the capacity to attend to the divine word. To speak of Scripture, we need therefore to speak of the Spirit's acts of inspiration and illumination through which the text and its reception are sanctified. This reference to the Spirit is profoundly significant for understanding what happens when the Church articulates the Gospel, whether to itself or to others. In the sphere of the Church, a particular kind of communicative activity takes place. A given set of texts is read and spoken about, and in these practices, the Church acknowledges the texts to be divine oracles, that through which divine communication takes place. To its core, therefore, the church is a hearing church, living in the communicative presence of God. This, in part, is what's meant by speaking of the church, as the Reformers did, as the creature of the word. Ecclesial existence is existence in the domain of divine revelation. That means that there is, by consequence, a passive or derivative character to the church's representation of itself in speech. If the church instructs, exhorts and proclaims, it's only because it has itself already received and continues to receive instruction, exhortation and proclamation from the word through the spirit. The, community, the communicative course of the church is therefore, as in 1 John, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. Life in the society of the church is also life in which the Spirit builds up the community by the sacraments of the Gospel. God the Holy Spirit gives and maintains life through baptism and the Lord's Supper. Through? Well, not in the sense that human acts are signifying, considered in and of themselves, effects, states of affairs which can only be effected by God. Of course not. But the Church's acts of signifying are not to be considered in and of themselves any more than the writing and reading of Scripture are purely natural acts. They are the Church's acts, that is, acts in which, by his gift, the Spirit is at work, acts which therefore have a, spe a special kind of spiritual visibility and effectiveness. The Church's acts are undertakings to which a divine promise is attached, namely that through the agency of the Spirit, God will take these acts into his service and through them, make his grace, that is, himself, present and operative to bless his people. Sacramental activity, like scriptural activity, is a field of divine benefit because of the lordly movement of the Spirit. Well, this, for example, may prompt us to think of the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper in the following way. Classical reform tradition struggled to articulate an account of the Lord's Supper which severed the connection between the local and the effectual, and did so on the basis of two principles. First of all, the perfection of the exalted Christ, whose humanity is now in heaven, and second, his presence through the operation of the Spirit. Christ isn't here. His body is located at the right hand of God. It's not dispersed through space or lodged in the sacramental elements. But local presence of that kind isn't necessary to ensure fellowship with Christ. That fellowship is secured by the action of the Spirit of God who overcomes spatial distance, making effectual what is not present in bodily form. This is Calvin again, the Lord bestows his benefit upon us through his Spirit, so that we may be made one in body, spirit and soul with him. The bond of this connection is therefore the Spirit of Christ, with whom we are joined in unity and is like a channel through which all that Christ is and has is conveyed to us. 
first sacramental presence, that is, his life-changing relation to believers through this action of the church, is a function not of the ubiquity of his body, but of the omnipotence of his rule exercised through the Spirit. Though he has taken his flesh away from us, Calvin writes, and in the body has ascended into heaven, yet he sits at the right hand of the Father, that is, he reigns in the Father's power and majesty and glory. This kingdom is neither bounded by location in space nor circumscribed by any limits. Thus Christ is not prevented from exerting his power wherever he pleases in heaven and on earth. He shows his presence in power and strength. He's always among his people, breathes his life upon them, lives in them, sustaining them, strengthening, quickening, keeping them unharmed as if he were present in the body. In short, he feeds his own people with his own body, the communion of which he bestows upon them by the power of the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, a churchly act takes place, an assembly, words, prayers, gestures, material objects, and in all this, the divine Spirit is at work as life-giver in such a way that Christ comes to be present to the fellowship to nourish, reassure, and so nurture life in communion with him. Well, if that kind of sketch of word and sacrament has any substance to it, of course it's only a sketch, then two conclusions may be identified. First, the visible acts of the church are testimonies to the presence of Christ through the Spirit. The church can't effect that presence. He himself gives himself freely. The acts of the church are therefore ostensive or indicative, not practices which embody him, but acts pointing beyond themselves to where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. That is why one of the great movements of the church is the sursum corda, lift up your hearts. Second, therefore, the church is most itself as it prays, above all, as it prays for the coming of the Holy Spirit, with which we may fittingly draw our thoughts to a close. And this is good old Bishop Cousins' translation of that ancient hymn, Veni Creator Spiritus. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire and lighten with celestial fire. Thou the anointing spirit art, who dost thy sevenfold gifts impart. Thy blessed unction from above is comfort, life, and fire of love. Enable with perpetual light the dullness of our blinded sight. Anoint and cheer our soiled face with the abundance of thy grace. Keep far from foes, give peace at home, where thou art guide, no ill can come. Teach us to know the Father, Son, and thee of both, to be but one, that through the ages all along this may be our endless song. Praise to thy eternal merit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. going to swallow me up as well if it's open. <laughs> Let me start off by with a question about relationality oh, right. and the, the rich term of salvation for Christ Jesus yep. that we're looking for. Uh, it's clear you want to avoid the bridge term confusing creator and creature. Could yep. you just say a bit about the notion of the image of God? Uh, <laughs> is, is that a bridge term? Why? Or does that complicate your account? Or... How would David you would love to talk about this. <laughs> um, I think image of God is a bit like body of Christ. I think it's a minor issue in Scripture that, for, for odd reasons I don't yet understand, has somehow expanded in dogmatic treatments to bear all sorts of weight that it's not intended to bear. Um, my own kind of preference, if, if one's going to use that language in anthropology, would be to go the kind of route, I suppose, that Calvin goes, which is to talk about it as relation rather than substance. In other words, um, it's not about a set of um, given capacities which are within the creature. Um, at least if by a set of given capacities you mean something that's describable 
without pretty immediate reference to, um, uh, to, to Christ and the Spirit. Um, I'd much rather say that we are images of God insofar as we are, are placed before him and therefore stand in relation to him. Otherwise, um, it seems to me it just gets tied into the whole project of thinking that there is a prior theology of nature or createdness or something which is the platform on which the gospel is built. And that, I think, is probably just not going to get us terribly far. Now, that being said, th th I mean, there's more that one would need to do, particularly with, I think, Christological use of, um, of image. My own sense is that that's probably not got a great deal of anthropological mileage in it, because it's doing other kinds of tasks. Um, uh, to kind of follow up on that, yeah. um, how do you know if a metaphor or a concept in scripture is um, is like like what you think body and image are that um, they they're there but you don't think they should bear as much weight as has been given to them? H how do you know if if a certain image is it just a matter of um, how often it comes up in the scripture or um, how you discern that? Yeah, I mean, it's partly going to be quantity, isn't it? Um, and body is not a major issue. I mean, there, there, there are some passages, but it's, it, there are clearly lots of other kinds of things that uh, would need to be borne in mind. People of God, for instance, election, seems to me much more a dominant kind of, uh, uh, kind of strand. You'd need to ask whether a particular um, uh, a term or a metaphor or perhaps cluster of ideas whether that's being um, used to address a particular, perhaps occasional issue, um, whether, in other words, it's something that's being kind of brought out of the bag in order to do a particular job, um, or whether it's something which, um, wi which can command much greater uh, attention. And you need, I think, above all, to, to, to give more weight to those metaphors which, as it were, uh, echo throughout the the basic structure of the economy. Now, body for me doesn't do that. I mean, it may just be I'm completely tone deaf to the metaphor. I mean, you know. Um, whereas election, people of God, would, it seems to me, echo right across the canon. You set all sorts of things ringing if you use that language. Whereas not quite so much with, with uh, body, which suggests to me, at least, that it's a more restricted metaphor. Now, that being said, you know, it, it's there. Um, and one needs to pay attention to it. Um, my reason for digging out Jensen's treatment of it is that, um, at least as I read Jensen, actually the metaphor um, is, I mean, it's the term that he's interested in, not his biblical usage. Um, I mean, body, in fact, is not expounded by Jensen in, um, in Pauline ways. It's expounded basically through um, social phenomenology. Um, so so it, it, it's the term itself that, that, that just kind of becomes um, like a, a, a hook for a certain kind of theory. So um, one, one would need to be careful with whatever metaphor one was using, you know, that, that it didn't do that. Uh, yesterday... Um towards the beginning of your remarks, you brought up um, the statement to be is to be in Christ's presence. And I was wondering um, how that's compatible with sin as non-being, or if you wanna just, if the question isn't valid because the being, the different kinds of beings are too different, then that's uh, okay too. Well, I mean, Paul thinks that um, when a person is in Christ, they come alive. And I, I think that means before that, therefore, they're dead. Now, you could, you could take that simply as a kind of dramatic metaphor, couldn't you? As, as, as a way of talking about the kind of baptismal passage from an old kind of existence to a new kind of existence. Um, I guess I'm, I'm inclined, I think, to take it more strongly than that um, in the way that, for instance, Augustine would have done to say, that to, to identify um, being in Christ with the fulfillment of creaturely being and therefore 
not being in Christ, existence in sin, as a declension from creaturely being. Now, I mean, you could, if you were a sort of Platonist, um, have a kind of uh, scale of being, couldn't you, uh, to try to explicate it in that way, that the further one is from the good, then the less one is in the realm of being. Whether one can work out the metaphysics of that, um, I, no, I just leave that to cleverer people than me, but I can see what, it, what it's about. It's a way of saying, I am what I am as a creature insofar as I enact the nature which is given to me by God and which I must, must fulfill by acting in accordance with it. Insofar as I don't do that, then it's not so much that I'm being a creature in another kind of way, it's that I'm not really being a creature, I'm not really fulfilling my nature, and therefore that I'm slipping into the shadows. Um, that, that the being that I have is... Um, it's, not, it's not quite what, what it means to be, to be full. Um, it, it's, it's therefore a kind of absence. Now, Augustine struggled with, with Platonism, partly because that, was, that he thought was an issue that he could get at through, uh, through that kind of language. He could somehow get hold of the fact that um, when we refuse to be God's creatures, um, although we think we fulfil ourselves, what we're actually doing is slowly eating away at our own being, slowly breaking down or something like that. I mean, that, that's, that, sorry, that's, that's kind of hesitant, stumbling kind of language, but I mean, I think that's, I think that's the force of that kind of metaphor. I'd like to ask you about the use of the word sacrament. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, in the 20th century, we had kind of two camps. We had, you know, Karl Barth, who called Christ the true sacrament, and thereby, uh, later in Book Four, because only Christ, as you have, you know, um, exposited, uh, can contain, uh, you know, the human and the divine, and the church is creaturely, and its signs are creaturely. Uh, Barth said they could not then be sacraments. Um, then you've got the 20th century Catholic theologians, such as Rahner and Schielebix, who call Christ the sacrament and then problematically extend that sacramentality yep. in the ways that you have described, but not named, you know, to the church. Mm. So I guess my question for you is, you know, um, Calvin did not call Christ the sacrament. And uh, I'm wondering yeah. if you would call Christ yeah. the sacrament. I think I would have a moratorium on the term. For, for a number of reasons. Um, one is, I think that the, the debate about Christ as a sacrament uh, is a debate that's kind of going nowhere fast, really. I mean, it just, um, it seems to be a debate that's actually about other issues than, it, than, than it's not really a kind of Christological issue. It's very often a way of getting at some other points. Um, and it seems to be just a very confusing use. I mean, it'd be much better to say Christ is the mystery or something like that. I don't think it's helpful to use the term sacraments for the two ordinances um, on the fairly simple grounds that it leads us to expect that what's going on in baptism is the same sort of thing as what's going on in the Lord's Supper. And it seems to me that that's not in fact the case. You can't sort out what's going on by thinking of them as two instances of the same kind of divine action, apart from at a rather general level. I mean, there's certain general things you can say. Um, it's very often the case that when people develop a theology of sacrament, they tend to develop it, well, first of all, in terms of the Lord's Supper, and secondly, they tend to, devo tend to devote, therefore, a huge amount of attention to how does God act through material objects. Um, and one, one knock-on effect of that is it's thereby very difficult to say interesting things about baptism on that basis, because um, material objects are not quite so significant in the way that baptism happens. Or what can happen is you turn baptism into something in which the really, really, really important thing is water, um, which is a rather curious kind of um, way, way of, of, um, of, of dealing with baptism. So, I mean, for, for those reasons, it seems to me that, that the term is one that is probably best, at least kept under you know, fairly serious control. It can do certain kinds of jobs, but don't expect the term to do to do everything. Is that getting at the question or is it not? Oh, okay, yeah, that's good. 
so then just to make sure that I'm clear on what you're speaking of when you're talking about the Eucharist, it's a human action ordained by, by God for the church, which points towards something which is occurring in all the, the Spirit's work. It, 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 it's a witness, too. It's a, it's a form of witness. Or is there, is there something else happening in that act? Well, that's unique. its primary agent is Christ. I mean, he feeds, nourishes, upbuilds, uh, encourages the church through this activity in the power of the Spirit. Um, its secondary agent is the church. Um, its reference points, it seems to me, are, are two. That to which it's pointing are two. It, it's pointing it seems to me, uh, to Calvary. Um, it's not pointing, I think, to, uh, to, to Maundy Thursday. I mean, th there, is th th there, you know, there is enormous amount of sacramental theology which seems to think that what happens at the Eucharist is a repetition of what took place in the institution. But the institution narrative is not doing that, it seems to me, eucharistically. It's saying, um, we do this because Jesus on Thursday told us to do this because of what was going to happen on Friday. Okay. <laughs> So it's pointing back to, um, to, to the once for all act on Calvary and saying it's possible um, for uh, sinners who are scared witless by their sins um, to pray to God because of what happened then. And it's also, as um, a consequence and, and derivation from that, it's pointing to the fact that we can do that because there is an intercessor now. Not in the sense of one who is reenacting a sacrifice, but in the sense of one who having sacrificed and having had that sacrifice um, accepted by the Father is now before us in the heavenly sanctuary and prays for us. And because of that, we therefore have access, have access to God. But oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. We have, I'll just get to your question. We have a number of theologians from the non-Western world. Right. Um, you've used the term metaphysics of the incarnation. Yep. Is there a biblical metaphysics? Or when you use that term, are you simply referring to the tradition that has thought about these matters in terms of being? And if it's the latter, should non-Western theologians learn that? Um, or what should guide their metaphysical thinking of the incarnation? In other words, yeah. to the global church, would you say you need to master these concepts, or are you open to the possibility of there being another set of descriptive categories? Yeah. Um, I don't myself think that, uh, okay. I mean, the, the core of the metaphysics is essentially the Nicene Creed of Chalcedon, suitably extended historically by all sorts of kind of fancy stuff. Um, but the, co the core of the thing is what's going on in Nicaea and Chalcedon. Those, it seems to me, are as profoundly odd to the Western tradition as they are to any other culture. Um, I mean, they're just weird, metaphysically. Um, and it's no more easy for um, Westerners to get into them than it is for people from, from other cultures. I mean, we think we can get into it easily, uh, partly because you know, we think we're actually better instructed in Aristotle <laughs> than we impact on. But, but also because the moves that are being made there are as profoundly odd for the Western metaphysical tradition as they are for, for any other. Um, I mean, in a, in a way, the metaphysical terms themselves are pretty dispensable. I mean, I mean, it, it's a big issue for the fathers, isn't it, that they have to invent these terms which are non-biblical, and that's troubling. Um, nevertheless, they think, well, I'm not sure the job can be done in any other terms, therefore we've just got to invent a kind of conceptual vocabulary which is pretty clumsy, which some ways says all the wrong things, like eternal generation of the sun. What does eternal generation mean? Well, the one thing it doesn't mean is generation. Uh, you know, <laughs> in, in other words, you, 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 you set up a term and you stretch it in certain ways, you add bits onto it, you define its usage by conceptual expansion, and that's as good as it gets. And it seems to me that that's, that's actually as much a difficulty for, for us as for, as for any other. Your critique of uh, Milbank and the Milbank crowd is yep. that ecclesi first ecclesiology, is, uh, first theology mm -hmm. is just out of order, um, essentially. <laughs> that, <laughs> um, I'm wondering, are there, are there consequences 
to that, uh, to putting ecclesiology as first theology that you're concerned about? Because it seems that Milbank is far more concerned about uh, the nature of truth than, for instance, the nature of the church or the nature of God. Um, and, and I'm wondering if the, you think there are consequences for putting that ecclesiology first other than it's just simply wrong. Well, I mean, there are, there, are, there are reasons why it's just simply wrong. Um, I, I mean, the, the, the reason it seems to me is that it just doesn't give um, a, a, a fitting account of the, the shape of the canonical witness. Um, I mean, of course, it's enormously important in the economy of redemption that there is a people of God. Um, but <laughs> um, it's enormously important for all sorts of reasons. And it seems to me that, you know, that, that, that the kind of radical orthodoxy line on ecclesiology is just not really articulating the reasons why it's important. And because of that, therefore, it actually ends up, well, first of all, with an enormously weighted ecclesiology, in which huge responsibility rests on ecclesiology. And, and second, I mean, as people often say, which church is this that people are talking about? You know, it, it sounds like something which is so ideal that it doesn't seem to exist. So that, that I mean, <laughs> in other words, it's almost as if their own critique turns in upon themselves and it sounds extraordinarily kind of extrinsicist, you know. It doesn't actually seem to connect with what really is going on in fundamental Christian communities around the world. Last question. I think I forgot it. No. Um, <laughs> Real quick, uh, actually a couple few, but real short answers. Avery Dulles makes the point comparison of um, body metaphor. He, he uh, says it's specifically a covenantal metaphor, um, covenant of grace, uh, the head, you know, Susan Vassal, or head body. I don't know if you agree or disagree. Um, also, marks of the church, uh, does you emphasize, of course, uh, the, the ordinances and, and the word, would you uh, modify or affirm Calvin's uh, attempt to define the marks of the church as, as the, those two things. And uh, Ephesians 5 is the mystery between uh, Christ and the church and the, the yeah. man and the woman, uh, husband and wife. Does that add a different facet or bring out a facet? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think you would need to do something on, um, well, you need to do something on union. Yeah. I'd want to, um, I want to go quite a long way before I introduce the adjective mystical union. I mean, you would need to do it, but you would need to do it, um, you know, having, you know, secured all the ornaments kind of thing. Um, but yes, you would, you would certainly need to do that. And you would need to do a lot of work on um, the uh, Pauline material about being in Christ, which seems to be very varied, and it's not something that you can just map out on a, on a, on a simple kind of, um, uh, kind of map. In terms of the marks of the church, do you mean the, 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 the traditional fourfold marks? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, you can use those as, um, it seems to me, as a kind of expository, uh, expository device. Um, I'm a bit nervous about ecclesiologies which, um, which do that as a kind of channel for the biblical material, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it can be a useful thing to do, but um, it, the, the danger is that it often just attracts to it. I mean, it becomes a structure, and, and people just pour into it in a way. Um, what they want. I mean, I mean, I mean, Kung, I think, is oddly enough, is a really good ex uh, exposition of those four marks. Bart, I think, is less successful in his account of the four marks of the church, in that um, he tends to, they just sort of set him going, you know, and he's off and he says what he wants. Um, but not always, it seems to me, with the right kind of discipline. Thirteen hours awake and still lucid. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's been eight days. He's been here eight days. He's poured himself out in the lectures, Q and A. I know with students over lunch. So please join me in sending him off enthusiastically with thanks. <laughs> <laughs>